Yeah, praise the Lord. Sit down, guys, if you can. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, glory to God. I know that uh, we've been in a little bit of an abbreviated uh, worship time the last couple of weeks. Our team, uh, I, I don't know how they do it. I, I, I tell you, if I had to... If I had to lead music or singing in the last couple of months, it seemed like I, my voice has just been messed up. Um, it's not great to start with, but uh, <laughs> but it's been messed up even more. And I tell you, I'm, I'm just so uh, pleased and the Lord has blessed us with people that can help us and sing and lead us and, man, just carry us to the throne of God. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing for us, an attribute. And hopefully... Uh, We've all experienced that, and thank you guys so much for all the sacrifice that you do. These guys were all volunteer and have been all the way along, and our praise team has been with us, uh, every member of it, I think, uh, for almost from the very start, except maybe Joe, and uh, he came on. He's been with us many years now, but uh, anyway, these guys are wonderful, and they do great things. Let me lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into what the Lord would say to our hearts today out of his word, all right? Father, in Jesus' name, we bless you today. Our hearts and our minds are turned toward you. We know that you have a word to speak to us. We know that you want to say great things. Lord, we, we pray that our hearts would be prepared, that our minds would be open, that our spirits would be open so that we can hear the things that you would say to us from your word today out of your heart. Lord, we want to be changed. We want our lives to be different. We want to, we want to move forward in life. So, Father, we pray that we would hear your spirit speak to us today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. All right, praise the Lord. All right, so we've, we started last week on uh, a series called uh, Change Your Life. I know that's really not a very original title, but it really, I, I was really trying to think of, you know, something a little more, <clears throat> with a little more flair to it than Change Your Life series. But it, it really just boils down to that. And, and the premise of this whole thing, and I know I shared just a tad with you, and I'm, I, I can't get bogged down on it, uh, uh, or else I won't make it through my 10 today. Um, but um, the premise is that everybody wants church to be relevant. And by that, we mean we want it to matter and to mean something. And and so uh, when we come to church, we want to receive things that make a difference in our lives during the week and for the rest of our lives. And we want to become people that, uh, that God could use and, and live his life through and that we could have the kind of life that the scripture describes, the abundant life, uh, the, 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 the faith-filled life. And... In order to do that, the Bible tells us many things in all places about areas of, of our life that are very important. So the problem we have is we get either bogged down by so much information or we don't really we're not really aware of all the information that is there because there are a lot of people that don't realize that the Bible talks about daily life. I mean, it tells you about how to, what kind of person you need to be, how you need to live your life, how you need to spend your money, what you need to think about, what you need to talk about, what you need to be aware of. I mean, it just tells us all of these things. But it's very, it's very difficult to synthesize these things. So what I've done is taken on the task of trying to synthesize uh, what would the 10 and into 10, uh, and I just chose 10 because of the 10 commandments, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, there, you could probably uh, add a few more categories and so forth, but to just boil it down to about 10 things in uh, four or five areas of our life that would be the most important things that the scripture would say about each of these areas of life so that if you want to be a different person, then these are the things that need to be true about you. And some of them, uh, it may take just a few weeks to change many things. Uh, some of them, you know, we're talking about maybe uh, change over 
uh, a decade, you know, in order for your life to be affected by these things. But we need to know what they are and we need to know what the important ones. So here they are. Last week I got into the, talked about the 10 laws of the mind and about how we think and what we think about and how the Lord wants to change our mind and what that's all about. Now, this week we're going to look at the mouth. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, that, <clears throat> this little critter right here. It's very powerful. Uh, it's tiny, but it's potent. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's tiny, but it's tough. <laughs> and it adds a lot to our life. And the scripture has a great deal to say. As a matter of fact, the book of James, which I know we've been through before, uh, just expositorily been through the book of James, uh, it has a lot, a great deal to say about the, about the tongue and about what you speak and so forth. So let's just get into the 10 laws of the mouth. And let me read, this is out of James, chapter three, uh, verses, the first couple of verses. And then I'm gonna give you the first law and then we'll read some more out of that same chapter. Uh, but look at these two verses first. My brethren, this is verse one, James three. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. Now, let's just stop and, and separate that for a second. This is true. We, we, we all, there are many things in life that are difficult for us, for all of us. And we stumble in these things and, 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 and we have to work on these things. But notice what it goes on to say. It goes on to say, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Now, perfect here just means mature. You're a mature person able also to bridle the whole body. So what is James saying here? He's saying that one of the most difficult areas of our life to get under control is our mouth. The, the words that, that we say, the things that we speak. And if we're able to do this, then we would be able to bridle our whole body. And I know that we're all aware of this because, man, we, you know, I would, I would venture to say that if you ask Christians, you just took a poll in Christianity and said, what is the most disappointing thing to you about your life and your walk with the Lord? And if you really thought about it, it would probably be something like, well, you know, I just kind of, I mean, every once in a while, you know, I just get out of control with what I'm saying. And the way I express myself, and we're thinking probably about losing our temper and losing control and saying things that you know we're not proud of, but we don't think about many things that don't really have anything to do with foul language or stuff like that, uh, that our mouth is really a very vital part of our life. And if you wanted to be a great person and you have people that you admire and you respect, I would venture to say that one of the things that you admire in people that you look up to is that they, they don't get out of control with their mouth. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're, they're under control uh, with what they say and how they say it and, and, and they don't let their mouth just go wild on somebody. And, and so this is what James is talking about. He's saying, look, if, if you can control that, the words you speak, boy, you, you, that's a powerful thing. All right, so let's look at the laws. Let's look at what God says about the 10 most important things about our mouth. Number one is the law of the tongue. The law of the tongue. I'm gonna continue on with verse, uh, verse three through verse 12 in James three. All right, these are the verses that follow those first two we just read. All right, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and they're driven by fierce winds that they are turned by a very small rudder where the pilot desires. So. Uh, the tongue is compared here to a horse, a large animal, powerful animal, strong animal, and you put a little tiny bit in its mouth and then you're able to control the direction of this, of, of this horse's whole life. You, you, you put him where you want him to go. Ships, gigantic ships are controlled by tiny little rudders that send it wherever the pilot wants it to go. So the tongue's compared to a horse, the tongue's compared to a ship. Now verse five, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. 
The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Now, uh, that's a pretty straightforward statement James is making there. I, I suppose, and I'll, I'll joke about this, I say, you know, the tongue is set on fire of hell. And, and we, can, we know this a lot. That's why God hid it behind these ivory bars and bathed it in this uh, wet solution all the time. It is a very powerful part of our life. And it's compared to fire here. And we've all seen how fire out of control just rages and it blows in every direction. And we've, we've watched images uh, even recently on TV where the fires out in Colorado just, uh, all of a sudden, it was like a fire tornado just swept up and just burned whole communities down. Uh, we've all heard about you know uh, fires in history where whole uh, parts of the state have been lost and people have lost their lives and lost their homes. And anyway, very, very destructive. Uh, and it starts with a little small thing and then it just gets out of control. Verse seven, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So now the tongue is like a poison, a botulinum toxin, neurotoxin, uh, the active form of it. Uh, is considered to be the most poisonous substance on earth. They say that one gram of this can kill a million people. And so it's a very powerful uh, poison. And, and in, by comparison, you think, okay, well, are words this powerful? Well, in one sentence, uh, uh, you can bless the entire group, uh, like Joshua said in, in, the, in the Old Testament passage, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. One little sentence, change the whole direction of the course of his, he and his family, or one word, one sentence in the other direction where the 10 spies came back as an example and, and said, hey, God didn't lie to us, but uh, he didn't tell us the land was occupied. I vote we don't go into the land. And so two and a half million Jews wandered around the wilderness for another 40 years and all of them that were 21 years or older when that statement was made died out there in, in the desert. So Words, powerful, quick, powerful. Verse nine, with it we bless our, fa our God and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So James is saying here in a nutshell, all right, fire is a good thing. Fire is a helpful thing. Uh, we cook with it. We warm with it. Uh, it. It has helped modernize the world. Fire is a tremendous blessing to have unless it's out of control. If it's out of control, it does tremendous damage and does no one any good. Drugs, poisons are a good thing in limited doses. Many of the medicines that we have that bless our life and keep us healthy, that fight cancers and all kinds of diseases are nothing but poisons that are limited and put in limited control. And it's a wonderful thing for us to have. But when poison gets out of hand, then it is very destructive in life. Water is a wonderful support of life. We can't live without water. Water does many great things for us. We use water in lots of ways. And water, when it is controlled, is a wonderful, powerful blessing in our life. But when water turns out of control, when it becomes a flood, when it becomes a deluge, then water is a very destructive thing. So the law of the tongue says, this tiny member right here controls your destiny. So it's a very powerful too, tiny, but tough, all right? Very much potential. Here's the second law. The second law is law of affirmation. To affirm means to speak positively, uh, to validate, to, uh, to acknowledge someone's worth. Not to be confused with flattery, by the way. Flattery is pretty much the opposite of that. Flattery is to speak positively, or encouragingly to someone in order to deceive 
in order to somehow gain an advantage uh, in, in their life. And look at what Proverbs 18 says. This is verse uh, 20 through 22, and I want to tie something together here for you. All right, verse 20, Proverbs 18, verse 20. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. All right, let that sink in just a second. A man's stomach shall be satisfied by the fruit of his mouth. So he's talking about the things that we speak being able to provide satisfaction for our life. All right, let's go on. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. So this verse is basically saying to us that you eat the fruit that your tongue creates. All right, right. You eat the fruit. Now think of this, stay with me, because this is powerful now. You eat the fruit that your tongue creates. And, 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 and you're gonna eat from what you sow then into the lives of others. Verse 21, next verse. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, this just means to have a strong affection for that truth that he just spoke, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. You believe that, you respect that. Those that love it will eat its fruit. All right, now watch the connection now with the next verse, verse 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. All right, I know many times people read the book of Proverbs and they think that these Proverbs are just little quotes and quips kind of sewn into one little put together and put into verses and that they really many times don't have anything to do with each other. They're just like words of wisdom and you just kind of go from one to another. But no, 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 everything has context and everything means something in its context. And so what is going on here? Well, here Solomon is tying the words that we speak to our relationships in life, like wives and husbands and sons and daughters. And what Solomon is saying is, Solomon is saying, <clears throat> when you use your mouth to affirm the relationships you have in your life, then those relationships are going to feed your life and you are going to be able to enjoy the fruits that you create in others' lives, in your family, because of the affirmation that you exercise in their life. I, I can tell you, years of counseling, one of the most devastating psychological maladies that people have in their lives is rejection. And, and, and I believe, personally, one of the things that we're seeing in America right now that is so devastating is we're seeing whole generations now eating uh, of that fruit of rejection, and now it has produced a, a very powerful uh, subculture in our society, and, and, and we're actually experiencing this as a nation uh, from all of the, the rejection and, and the things that have been spoken in the past. But listen, God showed us how to speak words of affirmation when he showed up at Jesus' baptism. And I know you, you, you remember the scene of what happened. John's baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River and God speaks from heaven and God says what? This is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Now, I'm just mentioning this because I, uh, I want you to, to realize the fact that this was before Jesus even did anything. I mean, Jesus hadn't performed one miracle. He hadn't done, he hadn't spoken one word on the Mount of Olives. He hadn't done any great teaching or anything. He hadn't even chosen a disciple yet. And yet here's God speaking from heaven saying, I'm well pleased with my son, even though Jesus really hadn't done anything yet for him to affirm. And I, I, I think God is making a point. When, you know, when things like this happen in the scripture, a lot of times you just have to ask yourself, why would God do this? Why would he say this at this time? Well, it's because he wanted to show us how we can affirm 
our family. I mean, how, how many, and I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but how many of you have ever said that to your uh, wife? Uh, Honey, I, I just want you to know I am well pleased with you, or whatever form you might want to put that in. Or your husband, or your son. Son, you know, yeah, look, I just want to bless your life. Boy, you are such a great son. I'm well pleased with you. I mean, you, you've actually spoken words of affirmation in, into your life. Now, I can certainly testify of this because after 44 years of marriage and after two children who are now uh, wonderfully uh, capable, gifted, hardworking adults, that my testimony to you is that I have certainly uh, been able to enjoy eating the fruit from the life where words of affirmation have created uh, uh, greatness in their lives. And, and I don't know how I would be able to live without the blessing of my family and the work that they do. And I believe because of many encouragements in life, their life has been exercised to greatness. That's what this point is talking about. Verse 20, you eat the fruit that your tongue creates. Let me show you one other little passage in connection with this and we'll move on. This is Proverbs 12, verse 18. And I took this translation from the Passion Translation. Maybe you've never even heard of it before, but it's a wonderful translation. It's fairly new, the Passion Translation. It's not a paraphrase like the Living Bible. This is a translation. Here's what Proverbs 12, 18 says. Reckless words, reckless words are like the thrust of a sword. Cutting remarks meant to stab and to hurt but the words of the wise soothe and heal. So in other words, the tongue can be used as a weapon or the tongue can be used like a, like a healing balm in life. You can use your tongue to build up people and to encourage people, or you can use it to tear down people and to discourage people. And affirmation brings life because people really do become what you tell them that they are. And words of appreciation, words of affirmation, words of support are words that encourage greatness in life. And sometimes the people that we love fail to live up to their potential because we haven't spent enough time convincing them that they have any potential in life. The scripture teaches us that we reap what we sow. So I know we think about that in terms of sin and our own personal reap, sowing and reaping in life. But let me just ask you, has tearing down and complaining and nagging and belittling uh, and, and speaking harshly, I mean, has that given you what you want in life? Well, if it hasn't, then you need to change your tactics. <laughs> and words of affirmation are a great way. They work, believe me, they work every time. All right, let me give you, let's go on. Law number three, the law of silence. Yeah, this law just says zip your lip. I mean, there's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. God created us with two ears and one mouth, right? What's the implication of that? that we should listen twice as much as we speak. Our ears are right out here in the open where they can clearly be seen. Our tongue, as I mentioned before, are hidden behind ivory bars and uh, wet in solution in life. No one walks around saying, let me show you my tongue. All right, so what I'm trying to say is that um, silence is a, is, a, is a tremendous asset in life. And, one of the, and in, in these years of counseling that I mentioned before, one of the number one um, uh, oh, what would we call it, uh, criticisms or complaints that I've heard concerning uh, the other uh, spouse would be, they never listen to me. Well, why is it that we don't listen? Well, it's because <laughs> we love to talk, right? Yeah, 
We just, we, we, instead of listening, we think that the, 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 the time is wasted if, uh, if the melodious sound of my voice is not filling the airwaves in life. Have you, ever, have you ever had this Lord say to you or you had this sense that the Lord said to you, will you just be quiet and listen to me? And you want to say, I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus. And he says, this is not the devil. You know, this is me. James 1, let me tell you, show you, James speaking about the qualities we need in life when we're in the midst of trials and temptations and troubles like we always live in. Here's, here's what James says we need. This is James 1, 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. One reason that we get angry so fast is because we are slow to listen and we are quick to speak. I mean, it's very difficult to, to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Let others finish what they're saying before you start talking. <laughs> when you're having a conversation with someone, especially when it's, one of those tense kind of conversations in life, what should we do? Well, we should sit there and focus and allow them to finish what they're saying. How many, now, and I don't want you to raise your hand because I'm not trying to start a fight, but how many of you have been really angered and, and, and your, 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 um, your feelings have been intensified deeply because somebody won't listen when you're trying to share with them something that is very important and they keep butting in and they won't let you finish what you're trying to say. That just helps things escalate, doesn't it? So sit there, listen to what they say, let them finish what they're saying. And when they finish what they're saying, then just uh, give a little synopsis. Now, you don't need to be rude about it and say, all right, well, let me tell you what I heard you say. I mean, just kind of say, all right, I hear what you're saying and then repeat kind of this little synopsis of what they're saying and then uh, make your response. And here's another little pet peeve of mine and I see it all the time. Uh, don't waste your time defending yourself. Uh, your friends don't need it and your enemies won't believe it anyway. So you're wasting a lot of time. Uh, I have seen people that are so defensive about things and so maybe, uh, you know, they just, uh, um, they're just, they're, you know, they just feel like everything that's said, they need to defend themselves about it and so forth. And it just makes a very awkward kind of situation and doesn't help. The more you talk, the worse it gets. And Proverbs ten nineteen says, uh, where there are many words, transgressions is unavoidable. It just means the more you talk, the more likely it is to escalate and blow up. Um, so sometimes just zip your lips, be able to control your passions and your thoughts and don't say stuff. Think about what you're gonna talk about and be quiet at times. All right, number four, law number four. Law number four is the law of the heart. Um, Matthew 12, 34 says, brood of vipers, <laughs> That's a good way to start a sentence, isn't it? Uh, I don't think Jesus read how to win friends and influence people, do you? <laughs> Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, my, my grandmother, and I'm sure you've probably heard the soul saying that um, if it's in the well, it's gonna come up in the bucket, yeah, meaning that whatever's on the inside of you is really gonna eventually come out of you, out of the abundance of the heart, you're gonna say things. Um, why is it that we, that we uh, regret and we wanna change what we say when our heart really meant that? I mean, why do we waste time trying to regret and, 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 and feel sorry for what we say when our heart is really the culprit. In other words, uh, we don't need to change our words. What we need to do is we need to change our heart. Remember, James said that, uh, that the mouth is a fountain. You know, the mouth is a spring and it produces either bitter water or sweet water. Uh, if we don't want bitter water, then we have to purify our water. Uh, like Elijah did in, uh, in Jericho. 
He went in, Elisha, excuse me. I'm telling you, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna have to have a talk with them about how close their names are. You know, Elisha and Elijah. But Elisha is the one who went to Jericho and Jericho had a problem. Um, its water was bitter and it was killing, it, not only did it, the, the people couldn't drink it, but it didn't it kill all the crops too. And so Elisha goes in, prays, he, he douses salt into the water and the water becomes uh, purified and it becomes clean and, 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 and it was good. So uh, if you don't like your words, then change your heart. Purify your heart. Uh, why, are, why are you so bitter? Trace it back. Take it to the cross. Lord, uh, if I can change the words of my life, if I, can, if I can fix my wounds, if I can fix the bitterness and the aggravation and the annoyance of my life, then my words will follow my heart. All right, so that's the law of the heart. Law number five, the law of foolishness. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 and 36. I've, you know, I've, I've, especially when I was younger in life, uh, I had people translate this, <laughs> this. I mean, they weren't Bible scholars or anything, but people just every once in a while would mention, you know, somebody's laughing, joking, have a good time and all that kind of stuff. And some, you know, some uh, spoil sport or some, some cosmic killjoy would come up and say, I tell you, you're going to be, you know, all these idle words that you're speaking, you're going to have to stand before the Lord in judgment one day, as if the Lord was really upset about people having fun and joking and enjoying things. So this is that verse. Let me, let me share it with you. Matthew 12, verse 35 and 36. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. So what are idle words? Well, idle words are those uh, insulting, uh, degrading, disrespectful words that we speak. And when we're challenged by someone, what did, wait, what did you say? We say, uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing. Idle words to me are nothing words. Isn't it amazing how funny it is when words like that are spoken about other people and how hurtful it is when words like that are spoken about you. And it's really difficult in our society today to not um, listen to some of this stuff because we have created an entire genre of industry that is propagated on the fact that we are entertained by put downs of other people. Now, the admonition here is not about don't tell jokes and don't laugh and don't have any happiness. The admonition here is just don't do those kind of things at the expense of others. What's the old saying? Um, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Has there, any, has there ever been anything more untrue said in life than that? I mean, my bones will heal. My bones will mend. But I tell you, some of those things that are said, good or bad, I mean, man, those things last forever. So be careful with the words that you speak because idle words will become a judgment against you. He, Jesus said, you know, in the day of judgment, all the idle words that we speak are gonna stand up against us. So when we're trying to go to the next level, uh, our words are called to the stand and, and, we're, and, and there's a judgment made based on the way that we talk and the way we treat others. All right, law number six. Law number six is the law of covenant. Psalm 89, verse 34, my covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. All right. A covenant me, it, it is, is a promise. A covenant is a contract. Uh, I grew up in simpler days and uh, uh, many of you are my age are, are older. But, and I know for some of the young people, you know, you look at us and you think, well, <laughs> you grew up, yeah, Methuselah was a boy. 
Uh, what was what's the old little deal? Uh, Moby Dick was a minnow, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, um, I know it was a long time ago, but but I grew up I grew up in simple days, days where your word uh, meant something. My grandparents could go and borrow money from the bank uh, with just a handshake, and uh, what was the old saying? Uh, a man's word is his bond, and people really. Uh, when they, when they spoke something in these simpler days, they meant what they said and they would live in honor of what they said. Uh, you didn't have to have a lot of written contracts and a lot of legal things because if someone shook your hand and, and, and said, I, I'm gonna, I'll pay for that or I'll give you that or I'll do that for you, then you could count on it. And that's where really uh, the word promise keepers are the, you know, the organization we guys got involved with. I mean, it's still around, but we don't hear a lot about it now. But back in the 90s, it was really big. Uh, called promise keepers, that's really where that came from. So in being a promise keeper, it means that you're going to keep your word. When you say something, you're gonna do what you say. And that's what this law is about. It's about when you say something, you do what you say and you don't say things that you don't intend to fulfill. If you say, hey, meet me at the mall at 10 o'clock by the fountain, uh, and it comes 10 o'clock, and you didn't meet me by the fountain, then I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna send out a missing persons report or start calling the hospitals, because I know that if you weren't bleeding or dead somewhere, lying in a ditch somewhere, that you'd be at that mall fountain at 10 o'clock, not just, uh, where were you, man? I've waited 30 minutes at the fountain where you were supposed to be there. Well, I know, but you know, something came up. I, I sent you a text, didn't you get my text? No, a promise keeper, a covenant keeper is somebody that if you can't make sure they get the message, Man, I mean, you, 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 you gotta go. You don't make promises that you don't intend to keep. Now, I know that as adults, many times, you know, we, promises don't mean a lot to us. But I tell you who they do mean a lot to. They mean a lot to your children because they don't ever forget a promise. As a matter of fact, they'll jump on a promise when, when one's not even there. You know, you've said to your children before, well, we'll think about it. What does that mean to them? It's on, baby, you know. <laughs> oh, well, all right, well, uh, well, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Oh, it's on, baby, you know. But, but, but this is an encouragement to look. If you want your children to grow up, to be people of their word, to you, you can count on what they say, then you have to do what you say because character is not taught. Character is caught, and they catch it from you. All right, law number seven. Law number seven is the law, the law of truth. Ephesians 4.25, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We're living in a society today where truth is an endangered species. I mean, we're, we're, we're modeled every day by professional liars. I mean, it's unbelievable, as a matter of fact. I, I, being from these former generations and all of us that have been here for many, many, many years uh, are amazed, I'm sure, every day to see and hear the things that we hear and see that we know that someone is not telling the truth. And so it's, it's, uh, it's really easy for truth to be uh, just cast to the side uh, in our lives. But listen, truth is the pillar of, of relationships. And because it, it, if, if you don't tell the truth, it's, you can't be intimate with each other because it's all, your relationship would be all built on a lie. And, and what is a lie? A lie is a, a simple definition of a lie would be what? A, an intent to deceive. Uh, so you can even lie by not telling one, by just allowing somebody to believe something that's not true. So uh, the scripture's talking here about the fact that truth is a, is a very important issue of life and that we need to tell the truth. Family is an environment of acceptance and we often lie to cover our faults and cover our imperfections. But let me let you in on a little secret. Um, they know. I mean, you can't, you can't hide things from the people that you're really close to. I mean, they already know the truth, so be honest about things because 
They'll respect you if you're honest. All right, law number eight, the law of the trumpet. The law of the trumpet, this comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And verse eight says, for if the trumpet makes a certain sound, who will prepare for battle? Makes an uncertain sound, then who will prepare for battle? Now, what this is dealing with is the Old Testament um, practice of the armies being sent into battle under the uh, instruction of the shofar, the trumpet. When, when Israel prepared for battle, there were certain fanfares that, that they would blow. And they would, everybody when they heard it, you know, have you noticed how piercing this instrument is? How the whole band can be up here playing and drums and everything, bass guitar, all that, everything going. And, and then I can step up to play this like at the start of the service. And you can just, this is just, just pierces everything. You, this just override, overrides the whole thing. And the reason why is because uh, it's intended to be that kind of instrument because when it came time for battle, I mean, can you imagine uh, sending information to a million people, let's just say out on the desert somewhere and uh, you don't have a microphone, you don't have any communications, no cell phones or anything. I mean, how are you gonna, how are you gonna lead them and know what to do? Well, when they heard certain fanfares blown on the shofar, then they would know it's time to prepare for battle. And so what this law is dealing with, and I think what, what uh, the Lord is saying to us is that um, in your communication with people, you need to be clear in your communication. I mean, imagine if you were out and you needed to go into, into battle and the shofar was not clear and distinct and decisive, like, you know, you hear a, like, you didn't hear something like that. You just heard like, I mean, that wouldn't tell you anything, right? So this is dealing with the fact that we need to be clear when we communicate to each other. And let's take it into the family just a second. And I'm gonna just say, in the family, uh, Dad, you're the, you're the trumpet in the family. I mean, you're the leader. God has hold, holds you accountable and holds you responsible. And so he's saying, I mean, it's really important, Dad, for you to be real distinct and real clear in your communication with your family. And let's admit it, guys, that we, uh, uh, we have a hard time doing this many times because, uh, remember, uh, men are headliners and women are fine print. Uh, when you come home, uh, honey, what kind of day did you have? Uh, did anything interesting happen today? Well, yes. Um, uh, Susie and Charlie are getting a divorce. Really? What happened? I don't know. Wait a minute. How in the world could somebody say to you that they are getting a divorce and you not ask any questions? Well, he didn't ask me any questions, so I didn't ask him any questions. If he would have asked me a question like, well, how do you feel about it? Then I would have asked him some questions. But since he didn't ask me a question, I didn't ask him any questions. See, man, we're real simple this way. You know, this is kind of the way we, we live. Of course, this can wreak all kind of havoc in relationships because uh, in order for relationships to be directed, we have to be clear and we have to be decisive. And let me just give you one little, I know I've heard men say this before, uh, no offense, ladies and I don't, I'm not saying that anybody in this room ever said this, so don't get mad at somebody. But I've heard men say, man, my wife just asked, oh, she just asked too many questions. She's always asking questions. Always asking. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, because you don't ever tell her anything. I mean, if you told her things, then she wouldn't have to ask questions, <laughs> you know, about it. Like when we're going out, um, uh, honey, you know, uh, let's, go, uh, let's go out to eat tonight. All right, what's, what's she gonna say? All right, where are we gonna go? What time are we gonna leave? Um, what do I need to wear? Uh, how much is it gonna cost? Uh, what are we gonna do with the kids? Um, maybe some other questions, but at least that many. So if you'd have just said, all right, uh, we're gonna go, let, let's go, let's go out uh, t 
to, well, if you, let's go out to um, uh, El Salito. Just choose a word out of it, just place. Uh, El Saltillo. Uh, because it really does matter whether you go into somewhere like that or where you're going to McDonald's, right? So as to what where. And um, uh, I've, got, uh, I've got Mary to take care of the kids and they're gonna do that. We're gonna go down about seven o'clock. Uh, man, I got a raise today. We need to celebrate, all right? So see, that answers all the questions. Be clear, be decisive. And then you don't have to worry with where are we going, what time are we leaving, how we can afford it, what, you know, all those kind of things. All right, so you get the point. Law of the trumpet. All right, let's go to the, let's go to the ninth law. The ninth law is the law of salt. I like this one. It's real simple. Look in 1 Corinthians 4, 6. You say, I mean, excuse me, Colossians 4, 6. Uh, the law of salt. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. All right, salt is a seasoning that we love and we, many of us eat too much of it. But have you ever gotten anything uh, that you took a bite of it and it didn't have any salt at all and it was just like, bleh, yeah. I mean, it just tasted terrible. Maybe you've been on a salt-free diet and this doesn't affect you because you, you've gotten used to eating everything without salt. But... I went over to England. Uh, I, well, I was actually, I went, went on a mission, did some mission work in India, and we had to fly into London and then fly from there into India. Well, I actually flew into a third world somewhere that they wouldn't even let us get off the plane while they fueled it, and I didn't want to get off the plane. And then we went to India. But, but we had to, coming back, we had to stay overnight in London. And so, you know, we're, uh, as a tourist, I've never been to London before, only been that one time. And I said, well, let me just get out and uh, walk down here and try to, you know, just kind of experience London just a little bit in the little few hours I have. So I went into this re restaurant, this little, uh, uh, little kind of looked like something from the movies, like a little uh, pub type place, you know. And we sat down and, uh, and, and ordered something off the menu. And man, when they brought it out, it was the most beautiful looking plate I believe I've ever seen. It had nice, some kind of nice meat on it. And then the vegetables, it had like uh, English peas, which I thought was very appropriate for the England. And they were really, really bright green, you know, like they'd been steamed. And then carrots, and they were bright, real bright orange like they'd been steamed. And then there was some broccoli, and it was just brilliant. I mean, everything just looked wonderful on that plate. And so I, you know, my taste buds uh, adjusted to what I was going to taste. And I, you know, it took me some of the English peas and stuff, and I put it in my mouth. And man, I am telling you, that was the nastiest stuff. I mean, it didn't have one ounce of salt in, I mean... Or, or grease or anything. They didn't cook it like they should, didn't put any butter on it, nothing. It was a, and I thought, as soon as I put that in my mouth, I thought, that's why Winston Churchill had to go to France to get a good meal. Because this mess is just terrible. Well, it's just bad. No bland, no salt at all in it. The law of salt says, you can say almost anything, and I'm gonna stress Almost anything, if you season it right. And do we need this advice? Yes, we do. Why? Because we know that men and women don't speak the same language, right? That women speak in code and hear in code and men do not speak in code and don't even realize, recognize code even if it exists. The example would be you go to your friend's house. You and your wife go to your friend's house to eat steak with, with the husband and wife. You get the steak, you cut it, you put one bite in your mouth, chew it, and you look at the husband and you say, where'd you get this steak? What's he going to say? He's going to say, Sam's, Neighborhood Market, Winn-Dixie, wherever. If you looked at the wife and said, where'd you get this steak? What is she gonna say? Why? What's wrong with it? Watch what you say. Watch how you say it. 
season it with some tactfulness or gentleness or grace. I mean, put a little salt on it before you say it, the law of salt. Here's law number 10, the law of apology. Hosea 14, two. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Take words with you and return to the Lord. What an interesting thing to say. All right, take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifice of our lips. So this verse is saying, all right, your words can change an offense. Your words can restore your relationships. Your words can, can bring healing. So when we talk about apology, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about going to someone and, and speaking words to them in order to seek the restoration of your relationship. Now, we don't apologize in order to change the consequences of what's happened. The consequences of what happened may be, they may not speak to you. Um, if it's a husband-wife deal, they may lock you out of the house or you may have to sleep on the couch or whatever it might be. To be, to be sorry for the consequences of an offense is not restoration, it's remorse. An apology is an attempt to restore the relationship. And I know that might sound like tomato, tomato, but when you apologize, here, here, you know, I've seen so many people do something that they called an apology that's just not even close to an apology. Say something like this. All right, if you start the sentence with if, it ain't an apology. If I have offended you, that means you don't really think you have. That means you think that they're overreactive and that they're, uh, you know, they're, they're upset about nothing because you hadn't done anything. When you say if, if I have offended you, well, you know you've offended them. That's why, you're, that's why you want to apologize, right? Because you, you can tell something's wrong here. It's not good. So don't start with an if, if I have offended you. Because, and, and, and what you're apologizing for is not necessarily for what you did. You might not even know what you did. What you're apologizing for is for the breach in the relationship that has been caused by whatever it was that happened. I mean, it, it may be something imagined. It may be something that you didn't mean that way. You didn't want them to take it that way. You didn't have any intention of hurting them in any way, but it did. And so when you apologize, you, you're apologizing in order to restore the breach in the relationship that has been caused by whatever happened, not just to change the consequences because the consequences are the consequences. I mean, whatever they might be, they're there. But if you can approach someone that has been hurt by whatever it was that happened, and you can just basically say, I am, I am so sorry that, that this has hurt you like this. I don't want you to be hurt. I love you. I, I don't want our relationship to be torn like this. And so please forgive me because you're more important to me than anything I mean, something like that in that kind of vein because that's what you're really after. You're after a, a, a healing and amending of the relationship. Well, what if they won't forgive me? Well, you can't make people forgive you, but remember, you're not trying to change the consequences. You're just trying to, uh, to remit the damage that's been caused to the relationship and you're trying to mend the relationship. I mean, look here at Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 23 and 24, 
Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, not that you have something against him, but that even he has something against you. Uh, leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I mean, sometimes our problem in getting with, in fellowship with God has to do with being out of fellowship with our brother. I mean, that's why, that's what the cross has done for us and God. The cross has given us an approach to God to a to apologize, I mean, lack of a better word, to apologize to God. God, this is, uh, please forgive me. Please, please accept me. Please forgive my transgressions and my sin. And, and do we have anything to be forgiven for? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, how many times have we, I mean, we've been talking about 10 laws of our mouth. I mean, how many times have we broken any of these laws that I mentioned? The law of affirmation or silence or foolishness or covenant or truth, much less any of the other commandments that God has given us to obey. So, this, so we take it to the cross. Because of the blood of Jesus, I can come to, I can come to, to, to God with words, Hosea says. Bring words with you and come to God and talk to God and, and the sacrifice of our lips, ask God to forgive me and apologize to God. And God says, that's the breach of relationship. So those are the 10 laws of our mouth. Uh, if you want to change your life, your mouth is part of it. And these are the laws that are affected effectively about our mouth. All right, let's bow our heads for just a moment. 